This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. All right. Well, do you want to just are you, you want to just jump in then? Oh, whatever. Yeah, if you want to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just tell listeners who you are? Yeah, my name is Mike Mitchell. I uh, originally from the UK. I came here in uh, 1986. Uh, my wife is from Minnesota, and that's how I arrived here myself in the state. Um, I grew up um, on the banks of the River Mersey across from Liverpool in a, a little town called uh, Tramia, which is a little, little village on the banks of the Mersey. Um, and that's where I started life. There. I was born in the, in the house. There's a lot of Oh, sure. Kids were in those days. And then uh, I grew up there, uh, spent the first six, seven years there. And then uh, we we kind of moved to a, what was called a prefab house, basically a cardboard house, because the housing was in limited supply after the Second World War. Sure. And... Uh, I always remember running around the streets as a kid in the 1950s. I think the first memory that I've got is in like around about the mid 50s, uh, running up and down the street with a red flag in support of the Labour Party. Sure. Uh, so all the people that I knew were, were all in trade unions or involved in the Labour Party. So Socialism to me was just part of life. Right. Everybody um, I met and knew would identify themselves as a Labour Party supporter. They might not have known too much about what socialism was all about, but they certainly knew what poverty right. was about. So and that that's how I started off, and you know, grew up there. Yeah, I was just going to start off in that, you know, kind of start off on that piece. You know, you and I first met at the, uh, I think it was a race class and labor movement event that was organized by the labor branch of Twin Cities DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. That was at May Day Books uh, in Minneapolis in December. And, you know, just to kind of go back to your, like, uh, foundational experiences, you told a story about, uh, you know, your experience looking for jobs as a working class young man in England and then coming home to discover some news. Um, can you tell that story uh, to start you yeah. during the discussion? But I didn't capture the whole discussion in the meeting, and I'm sad that <laughs> oh, I missed sure. that story. I, I, I'll uh, I'll tell you that story. Um, it was, I'd been out of work. I was like in my sort of early 20s, and um, there was a lot of unemployment around, and um, I'd worked in the construction industry as a pipe fitter, and it's fairly typical to work on a contract for two years, maybe three years, and then you get laid off and then get taken on for the next job when it came around. Well, I had a job where I was active as uh, a union activist and uh, and got laid off from that job. And then I really had a hard time trying to find another job. And uh, I'd sort of been out of work for about maybe three years. And there was a, by the Shell Oil Refinery, site where there was always work going on. Um I used to walk down this road. It was called the One Mile Road. And I'd heard um 
that there was a, a whole new construction being built and they were looking for people. And so uh, once again, I'd started off and I hitchhiked a ride to the start of this road. And, and I know it was like, I'd walked about a mile down there, reached the construction site and um, went into where the foreman was and asked if they were doing any hiring. And he, uh, he must have known me, I uh, knew my name, but he said to me, um, it's like, no, not for the likes of you, mm -hmm. which was, I mean, a really stunning blow to me. I, I was kind of just in shock when he said that. I, I kind of turned around and I felt a bit down about it. But I also said to myself, why on earth would one other human being speak to another one in that way? And you could see that I was uh, desperate and needed a job. I, I kind of didn't have much money. I'd run out of my unemployment. I was on so over there. I was on just a basic income, social security to survive. I lived at home with my parents, and um, I would, I would have been homeless if I hadn't had that place to live. Anyway, I turned around from that site and I started walking down the road back to back, see if I could get a hitchhike a ride and. Some guy pulled up and he, he said to me, uh, hey, why don't you get in? And then he kind of threw a towel down on the side by my foot. And I said, what's up? And it was kind of my feet, feet were bleeding. It's the sole in my shoe had worn thin with all the walking that I'd done. And, um, I just thought, wow, that was good of him to give me that. So he said, and he said, well, where do you live? And he took, he took me all the way home, which was about five miles from the site. And then uh, when I got home, I was kind of feeling pretty down and uh, sort of was soaking my feet in a bowl of water, sitting, watching the TV. And uh, and it was a day when they were celebrating Martin Luther King. And it was very moving for me to watch the TV and watch that March on Washington. And uh, it really had a big impact. It was the first time I, I really felt like connected with other people listening to that, watching them, and listening to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech kind of moved me. It moved me to, to the realization that, you know, all together we can make a difference in the world. And I thought, you know, I need to, I need to get out of this rut that I'm in. And so I came to the realization that I needed an education because I'd, I'd left school at 15 and didn't have much of an education. And I think that was holding me back as well as the, the system that I was living in was holding me back and I wasn't going any place. And thought, well, maybe this is one way out of it was actually to keep up my activism, but also to get an education as well. And that march on Washington and listening to Martin Luther King actually inspired me to do that and to follow through. And, and I did, and um, I ended up getting uh, degrees in politics and international relationships and um, and education and it that that 
really had that impact on my life. It changed my whole direction. Um, and one time I had the opportunity to actually go to Washington um, and I deliberately made my way to the statue of Martin Luther King there and uh, just put some flowers around that statue. It's kind of, you know, he's looking out over that river there. And there was another occasion um, when I, I went to Atlanta and I visited uh, his, where he's laid to rest and um, actually got to go into this little place where they, the hearst, this old hearst that they put his coffin on, take him to his final resting place of his. And I just kind of stood there and meditated for a while and just th thought about how much of an impact he had on the world and, and on me and, and on millions of other people as well, I think. Um, and that, that message of like, you know, never give up and unity and solidarity and how important those those values are for working people so that they can we can all go forward together uh, and, and really make a difference in the world, which we can. Yep. And that's... Um, that stayed with me. I always, it's, it's never left me that, that kind of memory of that day of the man turning around and saying to me, not for the likes of you, mm -hmm. the guy who picked me up in the car and then sitting at home watching that march on Washington those those things that day just seemed to change my whole focus on life around. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some people who were saying who said to me, "Oh, you you know you're just a working class guy. You 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 know you're wasting your time pursuing another educational track." Right. And the people who said that to me were actually well-educated people, <laughs> right. which read, which kind of, it sounded odd to me. And I thought, that's all part of the struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's what you do. You've got to make your own mind up what you do. And, and, and I reach out and find the people who share the same ideas, the same values as yourself. And also reach out to ordinary working people who are also struggling right. to bring them along as well. Yeah. It's, and it's very important to do that. Um, and uh, I've always felt because I've experienced poverty and I, and when I was really young, we were basically homeless and, long stretches of unemployment. Uh, I've always felt a close affinity with people who are living on the edge because I've mm. been there right. and I know what that's like. And th there are very hard times emotionally and there's also some times when you feel okay. Right. But it's a struggle. It's not a great place to be, um, and, yeah, to I was find just, your way out of it. I was just going to say, yeah, at that meeting, they, um, you know, they were talking about Martin Luther King. Um, it was Delta workers, um, you know, that that were looking at all this stuff Delta Airlines was putting out, saying that they are, you know, committed to equity and that they care about the legacy of Martin Luther King, you know, and so these. Delta workers had gone to Memphis to the Civil Rights Museum and they were inviting Delta 
management to come there and show that they're actually committed and that they stand with, you know, unionization and that they stand with labor. And of course, they weren't going to do that because, again, they were just, you know, they were just saying things, but they didn't actually mean any of the they don't actually mean the things they're saying. And so, you know, realizing that, you know, Martin Luther King stands on the side of working people is like, you know, that's an important uh, thing to, to, to bring to the table. Yeah, well, one of the things, I read a few books by him, and um, one of the things that he was saying, um, he made a reference to it, is like he was moved by a lot of spiritual influences, mm -hmm. and he was also supported by socialists and right. communists as well. And he said it's really important. He said, he said, socialist, a lot of um, socialists, uh, communists have forgotten about the spiritual side of life. The, mm. It's more or less the emotional side that what goes on with people. Right. And he said, they've got to find that. And so he said, on the spiritual side of people, I've got to, I've got to identify the material right. distance that people have to live with, the suffering that they go through, and that um, the two need to be the spiritual and the material worlds have to connect together. Um, yep. he, he made a big point of that, but. Um, and he, and he was and he educated those um, who were socialistically minded and and had and supported Marxism and uh, and communism. He said that you know that was the problem with the Soviet Union it, and some of these other countries is that they were being led by bureaucrats mm. who were well intentioned. But did not really fully understand the spiritual side of life that and the struggles that poor people were going through, and and would have a tendency to look at them as um, you know less than themselves. So right. he reached out to that and he educated people about about that, um, and I, I think that's what may help persuade him to start moving in the direction of uh, supporting trade unionism and socialism. You know, it was like he, um, I think, went to uh, Memphis to support the uh, garbage workers there right. in the strike. And I think that, you know, that's what sort of led to his assassination. In a way, he was becoming more than just civil rights. Mm -hmm. He was starting to connect the dots with the civil rights movement and the social and economic justice movement. He, he It was like, you start bringing those three areas together, that's, um, and creating unity and solidarity. That's just what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's where he started, that was where he was moving to um, and what since I've been in this country, I have noticed how those um, in power in the especially in the Democratic Party and in some of the trade unions have used his legacy to further their own interests right and not the interests of a lot of the, disadvantaged people and the people who are being exploited and discriminated at, you know, they'll go. <laughs> people who are very influential and powerful will pay homage. Right. But, 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 you know, there's still horrendous levels of poverty in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and they do nothing about that. Right. I mean, even conservatives try to claim his legacy here in the U.S. And it's it's just mind boggling to, uh, you know, I think to most people that are 
uh, you know, involved in movements and organizing and labor, um, you know, because like you said, when bringing those two sides together, the like, you know, spiritual or emotional and the material and these other pieces, labor and socialist. I mean, he was a coalition builder, right? I mean, he was, uh, that was yeah. really what he was doing was, you know, being the kind of like the, the center of bringing all these things together. And, you know, he had a lot of uh, great um, uh, people around him you know, his advisors that were bringing in those pieces, you know, he had uh, the ability to build that coalition. And, uh, you know, even when he found pieces like Black Power Movement, where he felt like young people weren't able to, um, you know, connect with the movement, he stepped, you know, he got involved in opposing Vietnam and said, you know, I, I, uh, I could no longer speak out against uh, the violence of young people in this country until I raised my voice, you know, against the greatest purveyor of violence, my own government. Um, you know, so, I mean, he was always trying to build these coalitions and find how, you know, you could uh, lay that common ground to move forward, you know. Yeah, I think um, one of the other messages I picked up from him was that it's, um, it's okay to be hungry about the system. Right. And the injustices mm -hmm. that one experiences. But it's important not to let that anger get out of control mm. and to channel it in a really positive right. direction by coming by providing like a way forward right. to show people there is a better way forward. Right. There is a, there is a, you can get on the podium and you and express and articulate the suffering right. that others feel and experience every day and you can and and you've got every right to be angry about that because it is in, in, unjust right it's wrong um however you need to we need to make sure that that's being channeled in a real positive right clear direction right. and not just not and so that the it finds its expression uh, in a movement uh in a, in a, a a movement that brings all people together mm -hmm. and doesn't go off down sort of narrow alleyways and, and get lost you know and you saw i've seen some attempts at doing that with the rainbow coalition here that was right an attempt um to do it but some of the things he warned about you know, going off in sort of alleyways and that occupy now you know what right. came about but it's sort of and black lives matter and the climate movement it they go they've gone off in these different directions mm. and sort of been co-opted into the system. He always right. was, was warning about the dangers of that. And, There's certainly um, always the danger of co-optation. I think every, you know, most movements, I mean, most movements aren't around anymore. Right. So most of them yeah. at some point or another have been co-opted before we get down too many alleys. I want to uh, just oh, okay. uh, kind of change uh, direction a little bit. After that meeting, we were just talking about the race, class, and labor movement. I had the chance to come and attend one of your labor international meetings. Um, and yeah. uh, so I was just wondering if you could talk about that organization, its role, and then how it relates to the Labor Party in the UK. Yeah, uh, for people who don't know, um, the Labor Party uh, international of uh, uh, is a worldwide part of the UK Labour Party. It, it's a, considered a constituency of the Labour Party. Um, in the UK itself, there are different constituency party, Labour Parties in Manchester and London and Birmingham, all the big cities and towns. So the Labour Party International is a constituency of the UK Labour Party. And so I am the 
branch secretary of the Labour Party International of the Americas, which covers um, North America, Canada, and all of South America. We've had members uh, from Chile, from uh, Brazil, um, the Cayman Islands, even. I don't know. That's a, a rich man's haven. But we've had some members from there, California, um, Arizona, and I'm the only member in Minnesota. Uh, to be a member uh, of the Labour Party International, uh, you have to be a British citizen, a UK citizen. People from uh, Northern Ireland can be members. And I believe people from Southern Ireland, if they were born in Southern Ireland, can also uh, be a member of the international. We're always looking for people to join. We know we currently have um, in the Americas about 500 members. They don't all participate in our monthly Zoom. Um, one of the things that we do is um, we can formulate some proposals uh, and we did want, uh, it, that can go forward to the Labour Party, annual Labour Party conferences that are held in the UK. Uh, last year, we formulated a proposal in defence of the National Health Services that came from our, our branch that went um, forward uh, to the Labour Party conference. Uh, it was actually presented and voted on um, with the aim of it becoming part of the Labour Party's uh, platform. That that didn't happen, but it, it did have an impact. It did have some influence on the importance of defending the National Health Service. And what we what we actually included in that was arguments to against any form of privatization and made references to how privatization of healthcare services in the USA actually works against the best interests of uh, the people. It's certainly Absolutely. against <laughs> The best, the, you know, the best interest of the country in general. So we we actually included pieces in that, and, um, and I know one of the things we highlighted was the the role of the um, pharmacy industry in America, and how you know they they charge exorbitant rates for prescription drugs. Well, in the UK, um, the low cost and the no cost after you reach the age of 60. So, you know, we think that's very important to uh, hold on to the, uh, the, the, the public nature of uh, healthcare in the UK and not allow parts of it to be parceled off to American companies who would right. start charging people for services. Yeah, I but can that, say, because I can say as thing. a nurse in the U.S., just quick, you know, that uh, the U.S. healthcare system, uh, while it's being held up by uh, some very well-intentioned healthcare workers, right now, the system as a whole, the system itself is a failure. It has already failed. Um, it is failing. It is continuing to fail. And so nobody should want to move to the U.S. system for their care, just so that we're clear. That's, that should be obvious. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think I if, if I got seriously ill, I could move back to the U.K. and get some services because I'm still uh, qualified for the National Health Service. Right. Still got my National Health Service insurance number and everything else that, and the prescriptions are, are basically really cheap, very very cheap. Uh, yeah, we're all, we 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 are very concerned about the um, privatization efforts that have been going on with the national health services and um, you know right. um, contracting out right. different parts of it to American companies. Right, and so 
the more information we have here about what privatization does, right? We can pass that on and put forward motions. Hey, don't go down that road, right. you know. Don't try follow to do the, the same American. thing in Canada too. Sell sell yeah. off pieces to private companies, mostly in the U.S. Yeah, and um, we have a guy who's a trade who was a who was very active as a trade unionist here with um, one of the big healthcare companies, and he kind of got a handle on. Uh, what they're trying to do in getting contracts uh, with the National Health Service. So that that's a type of thing we can do is pass on like information like that. Also, we did discover that um, it's now possible for ex uh, patriots from the UK to vote mm. in uh, British elections. So uh, we want to get that message out to any British citizens in general who right. are living in the Americas that you uh, can now vote um, in the British elections. Some of them may, may need to have a proxy in the UK who can vote on their behalf. Mm. But um, that was a, that's been a bit of a struggle for us and finally, the legislation was passed, which approves it. So that, so um, and so you were saying you're a dual citizen, right? And so you were saying you're looking for folks. You know, if there's people listening that are uh, uh, from the UK uh, originally, um, and they want to get involved, that's at Labor International, which is Labor L A B O U R International dot net, I believe. Um, yeah. And they can join through there if they want to get involved, right? Yeah, they they can join through there. Uh, if they just Google Labor International dot dot net or dot org, I yeah. can't remember exactly. Yeah. Uh, then they can get the information that they're looking for about joining. We have monthly meetings. Usually uh, the second Thursday in the month, they start at um, 18.30 p.m. That's Minnesota time. So it's 19.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, they run for about an hour or so. And uh, this, this well, later today, we have a guy, a um, professor from the U University of Minnesota who's going to talk about... Uh, polling in America for this for the 24 election sure I I uh, I that's great and yeah and I'll post the when I post this I'll post the link to labor international so folks can go directly there if they're if they're looking for it I wanted to touch on one more thing uh you know that's kind of the news piece and I know we talked about this offline um you know I've seen a few commentators declare that there's been a seismic shift in the House of Commons with the election of George Galloway in Northwest England's Rochdale uh, for the Workers' Party of Britain, just to be clear. Um, can you talk about, just quick, what, you know, I didn't know a ton about it before, what he ran on before this landslide win, and then what your th thoughts are on what this means for labor specifically, especially like the left of the Labor Party? And just to be, what I mean by that is, are they going to have to kind of take on some more of this rhetoric around left wing positions? Do you think, or do you think people, some people are going to leave the labor party that are in the left of the labor party now? What's your, what's your feeling or understanding of what's going on in Britain with the, this whole, this whole thing right now? Well, actually, uh, just before I get into this, yeah, just to try to give some backgrounds best I can. The, the shift that's been going on in the Labour Party actually, you know, it occurred around about 2018-19 and then, you know, the COVID period. And it, it, like, it shifted left with the election of Jeremy Corbyn as the leader. And it brought in another about three or 400,000 new members into the Labour Party. Mm. People were generally dissatisfied with the direction of the country and with the Conservatives that had been building for quite a while. And they were dissatisfied with 
the way the Labour Party had supported when it, uh, the uh, austerity, the neoliberalism of right. the Conservatives, and that sort of that level of dissatisfaction, and some changes in the internal party democracy, led to Jeremy Corbyn being elected. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just trying to cut this as short as it can, but um, it's fine. What what happened with at that point is that the establishment got very very concerned, especially mm -hmm. when um, the increased membership and the vote of the Labour Party. Um, they, they so the the media, the right wing media, went on the attack against Corbyn, and um, then there was the election that sort of saw him lose. And that was, people. a lot of people said that was because of uh, the, the, the attacks of the media and the right. fact that they were accusing him of being anti-Semitic and mm -hmm. that guy's never been that way right. at all. And so um, they had a new leadership uh, election and Keir Starmer, who was in the shadow cabinet with Corbyn, surprise, surprise, though everybody thought he was more centre-left, mm. but he actually then swung centre-right and got back in line with the, with the neoliberalism and the austerity ideas that had gone before with the Labour Party. And I think what he, he's trying to capture the middle England vote, the uh, the dissatisfied conservative voter, because they're out there, they're not happy with the with the way that the conservative governments have been managing the economy in the in the in the last uh, ten years or so. So they're out there wondering which way to vote. And Labour is, he's sort of reined in the left-wing rhetoric. He's mm -hmm. uh, kind of got rid of anybody who's been articulating left-wing views within the Labour Party. He doesn't like it. He sort of, because of his strategy, thinks that he can win an election by appeal appealing to the independent Middle England conservative voter. Right, I want to I want to say one thing quick. Uh, I mean, this is what the Democratic Party does in the U.S., right? You yeah. know, this is like this is their strategy. So that's coming right from their playbook. And I'll oh, say yeah. one other thing: if we run out of time, I'll download okay. this quick and I'll send you another link. Cause, okay. Because because I, I don't have a I don't have a, a what I, I don't have a license. So because I'm how much before. time have we got? We got a minute left, but I'll send you another link okay. in a minute. So George Galloway is like uh he's he's always been around there. They call him the lone wolf. Mm. He has been able to connect the dots between what's going on in the Labour Party, the their stance on Gaza, and the economy. He's been able to do that. He's saying Look at all the money that's going and, and the immor immorality of what's going on with Gaza and look at your own life and the struggles that you've got with unemployment and the rising cost of living. He's connected all that together and presented it to that electorate in Rochdale. And they just went, well, that's what we're looking for and voted him in to office. Right. But don't forget, he's he's been elected about four five times from different different constituencies. So um, the workers the workers party was formed in response to the um the numbers of people who were being kicked out of the party, out of the Labour Party for their right. for their left wing views and supposedly anti Semitic comments, which would basically seem to be more of an excuse just to get rid of what Starmer had identified right. as possible troublemakers for him. When it comes to George Galway, I, a friend of mine sent me an email, and I'll just quote. He said, this is an historic victory for George and a well-deserved kick up the arse for Starmer 
mm -hmm. and his gang of right wing Blairites. You know, this guy's been a, a long time Labour voter. Right. Says I hope they put up a candidate in my constituency in the general election this year. I'll vote for them if they do. Mm. Now that's a now he's just one. So that's a strong sentiment that's out right. there for uh, the Workers' Party in the UK. Um, and um, you see this, this is like a, I would say what's happening in the UK is a splintering. It, 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 it's going to be like, Labour's going to be coming in without any real clear, clear policies. Mm -hmm. And that's not unified. So you, you, you um, there's a real, it's just, you could say, see, Marx had said, you know, in times of crisis, the, the establishment parties start to divide and split. Right. And so when one, like the Conservative Party in Britain right now, is, is, um, hasn't done a good job of managing the economy, it's got a lot of internal problems with it can't control uh, as it's losing its popularity, then right wingers are starting to make racist comments. And the leadership of the party can't control it. So it's starting to divide within itself. Right. So you most probably end up with sort of a, a much reduced conservative party, a rump of a party after the general election and then you've got these other like the green party and the liberal democratic party the SNP, the democrat party from ireland i mean and then the labor parties coming in without a real clearly defined agenda on what they're going to do uh, or how they're going to do it you know right and it and so they're gonna you know, there's an old adage that says um, oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. Right. And that's what's happening here. It's like, so the opposition, which is majority Labour, is going to be elected into office and is going to be, have to implement policies to get the economy sorted out and other things. But um, they say they're going to, this is what they're going to do, but they don't say how they're going to do it. And it so, but it does seem like to be able to implement um, what needs to be done is going to take a lot of money and a lot of time, and it's going to have a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. So it's going to be quite disruptive, I think, it, um, for the next five years in the UK. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the Workers' Party is going to have. I think have a big influence in the general election, right? Um, especially in the north of England, there's a lot of been a lot of underinvestment, right? In the cities, in the towns of the north of England, and people are very, very dissatisfied. You now, when I go over there, um, you know, I, I I can go around some of the local towns, and they're in decline. I mean, the, the shopping areas, it's like. They've just been left um, to fall apart or boarded up shopping precincts. Um, they just can't afford, the local people can't afford to um, maintain the shops, keep them running. Um, right. It's not profitable. So the small business people um, have just not been able to make it. And, um, and it's sort of an industrial decline has been taking place. So people find themselves doing a lot of gig work. You know, there's yep. a lot of these, they always brag about, oh, well, unemployment's low. But what they don't talk about is the that the employment that's out there is gig work. And they don't, right. um, you know, just like here, there's no long-term security. They're on call, um, you know, as and when needed. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the the thing I was seeing this morning about George Galloway is 
you know, it's after his election. Now Rishi Sunak had to come out right away and make his like first, like, <laughs> you know, real, uh, uh, address or whatever. And, uh, and, and start, you know, going after him right away. And then all the media was coming out right away, you know, to, to, well, not, maybe not all the media, but a lot of the media was coming out to line up and, parrot uh rishi sunak's lines about him being divisive and all this other stuff that he said so it seems like yeah like you said the um establishment is very um uh is very uh uh, uh scared about this yeah so, they're worried about this this workers party the conservatives are especially well both parties are worried about um the impact that the workers party is going to have in the north of england it's going to you know that what happened in the last election, they had this, what they call the so-called red wall, where traditional labor, it was like 50 MPs, mm. were um, kind of switched over from labor to conservative, these mm. local constituencies, because um, over Brexit, they didn't particularly like the stance that uh, the Labour Party had taken on, on Brexit. Right. That was a big defeat. And, you know, what I discovered when I was over there, that the real that the issue for a lot of those voters was they thought that Britain um, was losing its, not, its identity. Right. Um, and they were worried about um, that issue of sovereignty. And so that they were concerned that the Labour Party was still going to, you know, they didn't trust the Labour Party. They they thought the Conservative Party was the best option because Johnson had said, you know, we're getting out of Europe from our high water. That, that was the vote winner for them. Um, and uh, so that sentiment is still there. Well, you know, George Galway, he's 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 of the opinion that, you know, yeah, let's stay out of Europe, um, and that has a, still has a tremendous amount of appeal in the north of England. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a big vote getter for him. Gaz is the big issue. He wrote he's wrote he wrote to victory on the um, anti Gaza, uh, right. The attacks and connected, as I said, connected all the dots. He said to people, you know, he's saying to people, "Hey, look, we're spending millions, billions on this to giving Israel all this money, and we're also supporting the war in Ukraine." Right. And there's no money coming into the cities, into our town. Right. You know, so he just came out with a clear statement. Um. I mean, and he got a strong constituency there of of the um, Islamic population. You know, a lot of Muslims mm -hmm. who are all you know at, who are demanding the ceasefire, right? Immediate ceasefire. So, and they also, you know, it, it sort of he was able to draw their attention to that to the, say, and the party part of the reason why you're suffering economically. And if that brought in the local population, uh, traditional population as well, saying, hey, you know, we can't go on like this. We've got to stop it. Right. And it was a vote winner. Well, and that's still going to be the case come the general election. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if uh, they start taking seats from Labour. Yeah, and, Labour and Conservative, actually. Right. And I was going to say just of the of the um, Brexit piece. I mean, you know, this this issue with uh, raising concerns and stuff about the common market. You know, you can go back and see a bunch of videos of Tony Benn, like raising this stuff, uh, you know, saying that there's, you know, concerns about uh, joining mm. the common market. But unfortunately, you know, with Brexit, the right really capitalized on that position a lot more than the left did, even though that has yeah. been a, it's not like it's a new left wing position, but the right was a lot, seemed a lot more prepared to, I feel like the left was like, oh, do we, do we like Brexit? Do we not like Brexit? And they couldn't quite get organized and unified around a, a message on Brexit. And then 
to the piece about um you know to the piece about uh you know uh uh, uh the the move of Starmer to the to the center right it's like i mean it's the same thing with the again with the democrats in the us it seems like they're you know the more that they move to the center and to the right their only real uh policy position is like we're not trump like hey we're look we're not trump like vote for us because we're not trump and they don't have any like or they have very little actual like policy positions that they can point to or policy wins that they can point to to yeah. say like this is what we did for you this is what we represent that we represent you know and it's the same thing i think with yeah. labor especially as the, you know and especially as they move to the right or especially if the you know the 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 blairite you know piece as you mentioned then they have no you know they have no good positions to separate them from the conservatives in a you know in a serious way so yeah that's right well now they've got the option of this new party out there um and you know i often think america needs a third party oh absolutely that's a, that's a common every time i go you know talk to my brother in the uk and other people in the labor party it's like they always ask that question why isn't there a third right party that's representative of the majority of the population in right. america right? it's a difficult question to answer and other than you know the established parties have got a strong control right um over the constituents in uh in america it's like the democratic party uh actually has been able to uh, to absorb the um the angst of the majority of working people it sort right. of comes up and it may it makes the promises of like life will be better under them and they they keep that's their chant they, they can always refer back to roosevelt right. Yeah, right to say like he was the great leader but it's been lacking sort of strong left of center uh people well it'll be um, interesting to see i mean regardless of what happens with the general election in 2024 i think you know i think for a large group of working people especially young people the the wool have, has been pulled off of their eyes and they can yeah. see a lot more clearly yeah. what you know what that's going to translate in for the general election seeing as again like they have such a stranglehold over the system and the reins of of power i don't know yeah. what that means but i think you know i think there's still a high likelihood trump could come back to power i think if Biden comes back to power. I mean, I feel like the honeymoon is going to be very short that the yeah. reaction to, you know, Biden taking what, you know, what he's going to call his mandate or whatever, even though it's probably not going to be hardly anything, you know, people aren't going to respond well to that, at least, like I said, especially young people. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see. I mean, the primaries are interesting, yeah. but, you know, most people don't vote in the primaries usually. And we've yes. already seen a backlash in the primaries to Biden. So, yeah, well, uh in, in my opinion, um, I think there's going to be a right wing shift, regardless of whether it's Trump or Biden. Biden will have nothing to lose. Right, right, exactly. After, if he gets elected, he can he doesn't he can just turn around and say, "Forget pushing me left." Yeah, exactly. I don't need I because I've only got four years. This is one term. Right. And so he can just focus on. Uh, being sent, you know, continuing to be center right or even right. more right. Exactly. Yeah. He does, and he can just go with the Republicans on the border. Uh, he just Everything. I mean, he's already policy. he's already setting up to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 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 he's got nothing to lose. Right. There's no argument that can be made to say we can push Biden left. He doesn't. He doesn't. He he just sits around and say, hey, you know. Get out of my face. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, he already says that. Yeah. Get get lost, Jack. You know, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. I mean, he doesn't seem to care about, you know, public and, uh, opinion and all that stuff. Even like even, you know, I mean, the rhetoric has changed a little bit. But I mean, in reality, nothing has really changed, uh, uh, for, at least yeah, from he, Biden's perspective. Yeah. He can push back. No. There will be a pushback, but I don't know what it'll yeah. look like. So. Yeah. Tr and Trump will be more right. Um, oh, Absolutely. But then, in a way, a Trump uh, 
election victory might actually awaken mm. the, the the left to get more organized. Right. And um, even some of the le even some of the liberal um institutions will pretend that they're actually left because Trump will be in power. So then they'll at least, you know, at least rhetorically will be saying things that will also enliven people. Yeah. And you know, that's that's the thing. It's so weird. The US yeah. is such a weird place, to be honest. It's, it, uh, it's it in is. some ways. Um I think in the UK, one one of the reasons why it was easier to create a a third a, a new third party was because of universal suffrage being more unified across mm. the country. Um, you know, and it, that as that grew, it gave an opportunity for working people to get organized. A unified suffrage it was like once it. Finally, he got home about right. eighteen sixty seven. It took another thirty years, but it, but people were starting to say, "Hey, working people now, the majority had the vote." And certainly, by the 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 final reform act of the nineteenth century, eighteen eighty four. Then everybody, apart from women who didn't get it till nineteen eighteen, had the vote. Right. So you had that and they were saying, OK, we need a voice now because right. the conservatives and liberals are not able to meet our needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, in America, what I what I've noticed is because it you've got these all these different states, the universal suffrage was not uniform. Right. It was sporadic. And so it made it much more difficult to create that cohesion around the whole idea of creating a third party. And then what well, added to the problem was the the Democrats were able to uh, uh, take the sting out of the out of the working class uh, angst and need for a party. You know, they, right. they said, we, we can do it for you. You, you know, just trust us. <laughs> yeah, they, that's, they, they love that. Yeah, we'll take care of it. No need to be. I mean, that's the thing. They're not even really a party because you don't really participate in any way other than showing up like maybe during the primary and then showing up during the general election. And then you just shut up and get in line. Basically, that's what they mean by a party when yeah. they talk about the Democratic Party in the U.S. They don't there's no there's no part. There's no like even attempt at party discipline. There's no attempt at like the party having an, a real internal life. I mean, even when you go to the like precinct caucuses or the uh uh um you know or the primaries i mean it's so it's just like disorganized and it's yeah. kind of like a free-for-all a lot of times it's not really you know again but well yeah. i don't want to go too much into the democratic party but i mean you know i really appreciate you speaking with me mike is there anything else you want to share before you go about labor international about um you know the situation in the uk right now or uh yeah. Oh, I mean, the, the one thing here, and it's it's somewhat similar to the UK, but maybe a bit different, is that's the role of the uh, trade union leadership right. in electoral politics. Um, you know, it was the trade union leadership that that led to the birth of the the Labour Party. It was the coming together of the unions. Yep, and uh, who. Um, we're able to get organized and and put forward resolutions at the Congresses that they needed a voice in Parliament and the current Liberal and Conservatives were not able to give that voice. So then they they started the early process off of forming a, a third party, which was called the Labour Party Representation Committee, then the Independent Labour Party, and then it became the Labour Party. So it's like a three-step process there from from the unions. But um, one of the uh, things about the unions is Labour Party bureaucracy and control that that has also evolved, where um, the unions tend to work hand in glove with uh, Labour Party when they get into office, whether they're right wing or left wing, and sometimes. That works to the advantage and disadvantage of working people. And that that's what I see here is that the unions 
10, I mean, membership is very low in this country. It's higher in the Europe. But um, the union leadership uh, uh, could be an obstacle to creating a, a third party. Are you still there? They're uh, super tied in. I was going to say they're super tied in to, uh, to yeah. the Democratic Party in the U.S. I mean, you're starting to see them, uh, you know, like, realize that they can have their own uh positions i mean I saw, you saw the uaw trying to use well at least theoretically supposedly yeah. trying to use their yeah. leverage to get biden to change his position on gaza or to change his rhetoric on gaza but they kind of gave uh you know yeah. sean fain kind of gave in at the at the end of that yeah. and i think yeah. there was a lot of uaw there was a good chunk of uaw members that didn't like that but i mean they're seeing that they can take a position and use their leverage, I think. But as far as actually doing it, their their ability to do it's been pretty limited because, again, there isn't another party. So, yeah, they yeah, there's the struggle. They they struggle with that. I mean, that was a victory, but it was a very it was a narrow, isolated victory. They mm. talked about it be, being a, a victory that would really start to help the trade union movement of this country grow. Um, but it did. It hasn't done that. It it they do, you know. They want to be part of of government. They want to have a role right. in government. They don't want to go. I mean, Sean Fain doesn't want to rock the boat. He wants right. to be seen as an ally of of whoever is leading the Democratic Party. Right. But then I wonder how the workers feel about that, and I wonder how the railway union workers feel about. It. Oh, right. What happened there? Uh, so it, 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 you know, the established unions in this country. I mean, they're they're, they're actually part of the system. They they, you know, capital and labor needs to work. They work together. Uh, right. And 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 so until such time as the unions start to realize, the union leadership starts to realize collectively hey we need another voice you know right. uh, not much will happen well and we need a you know we need a new union leadership too right i mean there's yeah. reform slates they're gonna take you know maybe a more uh you know a more um uh uh oppositional position to the democrats at circuit certain times yeah. not during elections <laughs> or very minimally during mm -hmm. elections they're gonna say oh well we're not sure we're still thinking I mean, there definitely was opposition to, you know, UAW supporting Biden, even though they said they wanted to see a ceasefire, uh, him calling for a ceasefire. Um, uh, you know, there was some opposition. I know there was an interruption during when he was saying that he was giving the the the, the nod to Biden. Um, but I don't know how widespread that is. Um, but anyway, I, just, I, uh, I wanted yeah. to kind of wrap up, but I really appreciate yeah. the time. And I'll put a link in there to the uh, Labor International um, and then, um, yeah, I'm sure we should talk, we should talk again, uh, in the future at some point. I really appreciate your time, Mike. Okay. If this is finished, uh, I did have one other point of view, but it's... go, go for it, go for it. And then let's okay. wrap up. All right. Um, you know, there is a, what I've noticed in this country is a, there is a strong progressive movement that's, that sort of finds it difficult to come together. They, they're all out there, these different groups. And there are also people, progressives who, I call them progressives, but they seem more liberal-minded progressives to me, and they get elected. And they get sucked into the system. Uh, they're not really thinking clearly about some of the solutions to the problems that are out there. And I... This is one issue, for example, that I have been following. And I can, um, and it seems to me there's an absence of being able to look at the problem and come up with a socialist solution or put forward a socialist kind of right. uh, view of it, solution to it. And that, this is the case of the Uber drivers in Minneapolis. Oh, are being, you know, they're being exploited by Lyft and Uber. Mm -hmm. And so they come up. See, that's that that to me 
the reason why that's happening from a socialist perspective is because there is a total lack of a coordinated transportation system. The transportation system itself has been privatized. So that, so that privatization creates an opening for big corporations like Uber and Lyft to come in and get established, right. get connected with local power brokers, and then they stop. So that that's that's a a a capitalist solution to a public need. That so the lack of a coordinated transportation system is, is what the real solution needs to be is to is to start working towards that for the greater Minneapolis area and not so to so that right. those drivers would have opportunities to come in and work for a, pu a public authority that's coordinating all of the transportation. And they would get really good paying jobs with healthcare and everything else. But um, so you can argue that, yes, we need the ordin ordinance to, to go in place to support these workers so that they're not being exploited. But you also need to start arguing in favor of putting forward recommendations for a coordinated transportation system. There needs to be some right. grouping around that whole issue that right. needs to be taking place. Nobody on that council, apart from uh, Akin and Cashman, who said that, she actually quoted that when in the dis in the discussions, she said, it's a pity we don't have a coordinated right. transportation system. But that's the socialist solution mm -hmm. to a capitalist problem. It The solution, so what, what we're doing with the putting forward, yeah, the ordinance, the ordinance is like to say, that's a capitalist term. It's a Band-Aid. Right. Really, it's not. So to you've got to push beyond that band-aid. Right. They're always on the defensive, really. Yes. Like they're always and trying so, to solve the problem that's already been created instead of proposing a new, and, you know, way forward. So the problem doesn't go away. You can get the, the workers can get the pay increases and so on. But the but that's still that exploitation, that still relationship of a private corporation right. and these workers does not does not solve the problem, the underlying problem of the privatization of something that's a public need. If if you have a public need for transport, which you right. do, then it needs to have a public solution, not a private capitalist solution. Private capitalist solution is pay the workers a bit more. Right. Yep. See, that to me is yep. what I, I see a lot of that going on here yep and uh, you know it, this lack of public solutions to meet private need to meet public needs is is really what's missing in a lot of the debates yep you can't just find you can't band-aid something because it'll just keep coming back all the time it just repeats itself and the That's problem true. continues to deteriorate and get worse and worse and you know the companies can sell out, and someone else can come in. It, you, you're not, you're not addressing the underlying issue of that relationship that goes on with private, the social problem. Yeah. things. You know, it's the same yeah. with utilities and so on and so forth. So when we elect people to progressives to office, I think it's important that 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 sort of uh, question gets asked about. Right. You know, um, what do you think about public solutions to public to public needs? Right. And I mean, that's that's that part of that party discipline, too. Right. Is, you know, is people just go in there as individuals. You know, there's a cult of personality in the U.S. and then they get opportunism takes over and they get pushed this way and that way. They don't yeah. they aren't grounded within a party that really takes, you know, like real yeah. positions and tries to hold them accountable for those positions. So yeah, so you know, you listen. I watch the I watch the discussions that go on in Minneapolis right. City Council. And they're all individuals. Right. There's no party position. Right. And and then you also get people standing up and saying, 
you know, individualism takes over as well. Right. They won't right. support a ceasefire because, you know, they say individually, I don't agree with that. Right. Well, if you, that's that's following a a value of the capitalist system of individualism. Right. You know, right. it's the if you're taking an individualist position against a public problem here, right? I mean, you know, you're out of you're out of line. You're not a right. you're not progressive. Yep. You're using that as an excuse. Yep. So that there's a value thing that goes on too that needs to be challenged. You know about individualism and public need all yep. the time. Yep. To my mind, the way to judge any legislation is is like how far the solution to a problem actually meets the general needs of the public yep. and not just the particular needs of certain individuals or corporations. Yep. Well, I really appreciate your time, Mike. And uh, I think we should talk again at some point in the future um def definitely later in the year about some of these topics thanks so much okay nick thank you very much this has been a socialist news and views special interview